So I'm going to go ahead and this is a, we're going to record this. If you don't want to be on camera, go ahead and you can, you know, feel free to turn your camera off during the presentation. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody. My name is Mia Hall. Um, I work alongside Karen Shelter and Claudia Grasso and Amelia, along with our speakers today, Magali and Allison, um, with San Diego County, with the San Diego um, Domestic Violence Council. Um, uh, this is Teen Dating Violence Awareness Month. February is always Teen Dating Violence Awareness Month. So therefore we champion the color orange during this time. Um, teen dating violence is on a rise and there are some links to technology with teen dating violence. Today, we're going to learn what our youth leaders need to know in how to respond and um, address teen dating violence within their congregation. Um, so with that, I wanna introduce Karen Shelton, who is the, com the committee chair, and she will, and then we'll introduce the speakers. Thank you. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're really excited to um, share more information. Uh, the goal, one of the goals of the Faith Leaders Subcommittee of the DB Council is that we equip churches, mosques, um, temples, whatever, universal it's a universal work because domestic violence does not discriminate at all so we always start with a universal thought and about um maybe about a year ago i just had this thought that the earth is mad at us humans and all these things just started happening and um natural disasters were happening and we've had earthquakes um in southern california we are pretty much you know, not used to it, but educated on what to do in an earthquake. But there's been some devastating earthquakes recently, one in Japan, one in Turkey. Um, then here in Southern California, this atmospheric river showed up. And had you ever heard of that term before? I never heard of that. And all the rain that came, it's like the sky just opened up and poured out a bunch of water. And I know before they used to say that California would, you know, with the major earthquake that we would just drift off and become an island. But then speaking of islands, then what happened in in one of the Hawaiian islands recently was that those fires that came and just disrupted a whole community. And um, so it's like the earth is kind of crying out to us. And I remember smog. We had a big smog problem in California and they started changing things. And um, like vehicles can't have to have certain emissions and we have to get smogs every year. But I think the rain washed away a lot of the smog too, if we look at it. So nature is kind of telling us things, I think. So that's my universal thought. I'm really glad that you are here with us this morning. We're gonna hear some really good information. And um, I just feel like us humans, every day that we wake up, we should do our best to serve our community, to serve those around us. And I believe this is a room of people that give their lives every day in service to humanity and community. So we thank you so much for being here this morning and keep doing the great job that you're doing to help families. Thank you, Karen. Um, so now I'd like to introduce our two speakers. They are our co-chairs for our Teen Dating Violence Subcommittee, and that is um, Allison and Maglia. Both of them work for Vista Hill Community Clinic. So with that, ladies, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mia. I think Magali is sharing her screen so that everyone can see the presentation. Um, my name is Allison Huerta, and I work at Vista Community Clinic. And as Mia said, I'm one of the co-chairs of the Teen Dating Violence Committee. Um, I co-chair along with Magali Hernandez. And we are also here with Veronica Lopez and Ariel Kovacs from the committee today to explain to you all what teen dating violence is and give you some ideas of how you can do intervention and prevention in your work. Next slide, please. So we are one of the committees of the San Diego Domestic Violence Council, and our, our team has members of different organizations across the county. So we have people from Health and Human Services, nonprofits, education, and we have parents of survivors on the committee. So 
it's a really, there's a really wide variety of people who are part of this group. And so that allows us to reach a lot of people within San Diego County and raise awareness about teen dating violence. And um, this month, as Mia said, is Teen Dating Violence Awareness Month. Um, we, we honor this month by wearing red, especially on Tuesdays. I know um, Arielle and her team at Center for, Commun Center for Community Solutions have been posting social media posts every Tuesday as they all wear orange to raise awareness. Um, and this Awareness Month started in 2010, and it has grown larger and larger over the years. Um, and this is a really great time to bring up the topic of teen dating violence with both teens and adults so that people are aware of the complicated dynamics that go into this type of violence. Next slide, please. So teen dating violence is very similar to domestic violence. It's a pattern of violent, coercive, and manipulative behaviors that are used to gain power and maintain control over another person in a relationship. And these types of abuse and violence can happen in person or online, and it can happen in a lot of different ways. It could be physical, sexual, emotional, verbal, or financial violence. And it's also important to recognize stalking and how um, the internet and social media can play into this. Next slide, please. So if you look on the screen here, you'll see the power and control wheel. Um, I'm sure a lot of us are very familiar with this, but this just shows all the complicated dynamics that can lead to someone um, gaining that power and maintaining that control over their partner. And then if we look at this one, we see how much more complicated that is. So it's not just it's not just like a simple thing that you can look at and understand the complexities of it, um, but it can show up in a lot of different ways. And it's important, especially when working with teens, that we make sure that the material we're sharing with them and the examples we're sharing with them are age appropriate so that it's more relatable to them. Um, one thing that we found in our work is that using the term domestic violence with teens immediately causes them to check out because that doesn't feel relatable to them. They think of domestic violence as something that happens with people who are adults and married or living together. Um, so it's important to use terms that are relatable to them so that they understand that it's something that can be happening within their own relationships or within their friends' relationships or their peers' relationships. Um, next slide, please. Okay, I am gonna be turning it over to Veronica to explain some of the local statistics with you all. Hi, thank you. I don't know why my name's Paul Martinez today, but I'll take it. <laughs> um, my name's Veronica Lopez and I am the Bilingual Education Specialist at the Community Resource Center. Um, so my job is to create prevention um, so that we are not going through these things. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and, uh, I just wanted to say something really fast um, because something that Karen said is very, very true. It's um, the universe is trying to tell us, wake up, wake up, let's solve this. Let's create prevention programs and let's address these things before they get before the before they get into crisis mode. So Karen, I think you're spot on with that. So to go into some of the statistics, um, San Diego teen dating violence stats, 6.1% of youth were either hit, slapped, physically hurt on purpose by their partner during 2019. 10.4% um, of youth experienced sexual dating violence during 2019 as well. 20% of youth experienced their dating partner trying to hurt or emotionally hurt them during 2019. And it's kind of interesting, right? It's all before COVID happens, kind of like the before the whole shake it up. So next slide, please. Um, so this is to show you a little bit more statistics on this. One in 15 have ex of teens have experienced some type of physical dating violence in the last year alone, six and a half percent being male and 20 percent being female. So as we can see, it's not just female. Now it's also going into the male dynamics as well. One in four reported experiencing emotional violence in the last year. So we have some silence to break here um, in people not reporting it or thinking that, oh, this is just something that's normal or maybe being embarrassed to report it. Um, one in seven have experienced sexual dating violence in the last year. 
uh, five of them, 5% being male and 8% being female. And the bottom right here shows us that it's not just happening in heterosexual students, but LGBTQT and other students are at a higher risk, as you can see, at a 24% risk and a 53% risk um, in these uh, dynamics as well. So we also have to address them and keep them um, safe as well. And go ahead to the next slide, please. The effects of TDV. So youth who are victims of teen dating violence are more likely to experience symptoms like of depression and anxiety. Um, they're looking at exhibiting antisocial behaviors like lying, theft, bullying, or hitting. Think about suicide. So as you can see, some of these symptoms that we see sometimes in students of like their heads down, gosh, that person looks sad all the time, or they're always experiencing anxiety, that we have to try and look deeper into um, these symptoms and not just kind of dismiss them as in, oh, that just person suffers from depression or they're just suffering through anxiety, but really trying to get to the root of what is causing this. 26% of women and 15% of men experience intimate partner intimate partner violence before the age of 18. So these teens are going into adulthood with already having a bad experience. And so then just imagine what that does to them as adults, as they're trying to also create, you know, their families. Um, and so then it's like stopping the chain of abuse, right? How do we stop this chain um, from continuing to happen? 50% of students who experience teen dating violence say that at least some of the violence took place on school grounds. So that tells us that we have an opportunity to address it um, at school and then address it, you know, with their parents and get further um, with counseling and, and just create more programs to be able to, to support them on this journey. Go ahead, next. What can trauma look like? So this is a really important slide because it looks like, you know, it can look like anxiety, worrying and about the safety or self of others, um, violence, uh, you know, in play or just a lot of interest in violence, um, like even at home, like for example, if, you, if your child is, you know, watching a lot of vi violent shows at home, kind of taking note of that and thinking, hmm, you know, what is it that, that you, you know, what is it that you see there? Is that okay? How do you feel about it? Kind of asking those type of questions and see what they respond to that. Um, moods, irritability, moodiness, mood swings, um, not dismissing it as in just, oh my gosh, it's just a moody teen. Um, withdrawn, um, a lot, I, and I've seen this quite a bit, um, is, you know, having the inability to focus and pay attention in class. So constantly being, uh, disrupted or just not being able to really, really focus and withdrawn from people and activities. Um, a lot of people, you know, automatically want to kind of put a label on that and say like, oh, this is, you know, this is ADHD. This is what it is. But really it's, it's about time that we start looking at, you know, some people do have those symptoms, but it's really about looking at the root cause of this. Is there any kind of sexual violence there? Is there any kind of understanding trauma that's causing or adding to um, their inability to focus. And aggression, you know, angry outbursts at other people, um, substance abuse, you know, using drugs and substance dependency. What is it that we're trying to push down and cover when we're, when we're using this? Um, and stimulus, you know, over or under reacting to stimulus to either very loud noises, touch, or like, don't touch me, uh, stay away from me. Um, those are all signs of something that is is sitting there that isn't right. And absentee, absenteeism, which is frequently absent from school or activities. So not being a participant in um, the social dynamics or in school. And you can see that maybe they're just not present with everybody else. Um, so these are some of this is what trauma can look like. And it's very easy to just try and dismiss it and just be like, oh, you know, this is just something that's happening, but not looking at the underlying conditions of it. So next slide, please. And I'll go ahead and pass it over to is it Ariel? Me. 
Yes. <laughs> Good Thank morning, you. everyone. Uh, my name is Ariel Kovacs, and I'm the Prevention Director at Center for Community Solutions. Thank you all for being here. Um, so next, we're going to talk a little bit about um, kind of what what you can do, um, because, you know, we've shared what Teen Dating Violence Month um, like really represents and what some of the statistics are for youth living specifically in San Diego County. Um, and so when we do these sorts of presentations, we also want to offer some signs or examples of ways that youth serving adults can really tune in to, to understanding what um, the youth in their life might be needing or what, you know, might be coming up for them. So these are some um, signs of potential teen dating violence that um, we encourage folks to uh, be aware of and think about and consider. Um, the first is physical appearance. Um, this one is often the most obvious, right? Like folks who work with young people um, may notice like, you know, changes in what they're wearing, or especially if there's any sort of like physical harm, um, that's usually a very quick red flag. Um, but it could also be things like changes in weight, um, or, um, kind of unexplainable, like all of a sudden wearing a lot of makeup or no makeup. Um, so just things to like consider and be curious about. The next is some social emotional like changes. So how the, how our youth are interacting with others. Um, isolation is a, a really common sign for both youth and adults who are experiencing intimate partner violence. Um, just not really having a lot of social contact with anyone outside of their partner or um, separate from their partner. Um, and maybe like making excuses or apologizing a lot for partner's behavior, some recognition there that maybe um, some of the actions that the partner is taking are not things that they're co-signing, um, and maybe feeling a little bit stuck in that. Um, behavioral changes can often be really tricky when we're talking about teens. Um, they go through a lot of behavioral changes. That's part of growing up. Um, and so, you know, this is definitely not to frighten or say that every time there's a mood change, there's something harmful going on. Um, but you know, watching out for an increase in negative self-talk or unexplained changes in behavior um, and unhealthy sexual behavior, right? All of those can be little curiosity flags for us. And then finally, academic or extracurricular changes. So this is really looks like a change in a teen's connection to their community. Um, so changes in attendance, unexplained changes in schedule, a decline in grades or quality of work, um, and maybe a lack of interest in former extracurricular activities. This is similar to kind of that social emotional isolation piece um, as something that we would wanna be curious about. So there are many um, different like trainings and workshops and ways to really begin having conversations or clearly explain what healthy or unhealthy behaviors can look like. This is an offering from the One Love Foundation, um, which is a national organization that really focuses on um, building those protective factors and supporting young people in being able to recognize what is a healthy relationship and be able to name and label that um, and what is an unhealthy relationship. So they have these 10 signs, um, 10 signs for healthy relationship and 10 signs for an unhealthy relationship. Uh, and we really often use these in this line of work to start conversations around, you know, what does this look like? What does intensity look like? Um, what does sabotage look like with your friends? What does it look like with your family? What does it look like in a, in a relationship? Um, and just really explicitly exploring some of these with young people who may not be able to put to words what they're experiencing or may not really have like an in-depth understanding of um, why consistently deflecting responsibility or being possessive is could be a negative thing, right? Um, 
So having these conversations is a really great way to teach young people to think critically about the relationships and be able to recognize the signs for themselves and their peers. Um, and like I said, there are many different, like this is one offering, but um, there are many different ways of like coming at it, like different ingredients for a healthy relationship um, or different videos to watch. If you click to the next one, um, I included this healthy relationship spectrum, which is another way of beginning conversations or considering what um, an healthy, a healthy, unhealthy, and abusive relationship um, spectrum looks like. In recognizing that, um, you know, as we grow up, our relationships become much more complicated, and things are rarely black and white. There's rarely a person that's like, that's just an evil, bad person, right? That's not how relationship violence unfolds. Um, it more frequently is there are things that they do that are great and loving and really special. And then there could be things that are unhealthy and even lead to abusive. And so being able to both recognize that it's not always easy to leave a harmful relationship and it's not always easy to parse out you know, what are the things I love and what are the things that are good? And is that still, you know, is it okay that they're still doing these other things? Um, so really explaining to young people and knowing for ourselves, you know, that healthy relationships are based in equality and respect and like figuring out, like, is that the heart and the base of this relationship? Next one. <clears throat> So we have a couple of tips here for starting these conversations with youth um, in your life. The first is to build rapport, right? So young people, teenagers are um, not always well known for sharing uh, a lot of information and making sure that they that you're somebody who's trusted or having somebody, an adult in their life who is a trusted adult is really important. Um. So if you're noticing some signs or if there's something where you're like, this feels like something you should talk about, maybe having that offering of like, is there, if you don't want to talk with, uh, with me about this topic, is there someone else that you can talk about this with? I'm really encouraging folks to not be isolated or silent. Um, disclosing your status. So, you know, we do this uh, workshop for a lot of teachers um, and folks who are like mandated reporters um, we always encourage folks to disclose if you are a mandated reporter prior to having conversations so that a young person doesn't disclose something and then feel betrayed if you have to report it. Um, there are many, like we have counselors on our team who are not like mandated reporters and are able to hold confidential information, um, to a point, obviously if somebody is like in, uh, a lot of physical danger or uh, danger of hurting themselves, um, we would obviously make moves to support that person. Um, but figuring out, like making sure that they feel comfortable with what they're sharing and don't feel like they're being tricked into something. Um, the goal is not disclosure. So it's okay if a young person doesn't want to disclose or doesn't want to label, right? Or say like, yes, this is harmful. Yes, I'm in a violent relationship. The goal is to create a space where young people know that they can talk to you without judgment. They can get resources. They can get support. Um, really opening up that conversation because things rarely, a disclosure rarely leads to an immediate leaving of the situation. Um, and so really that's not the, the goal. The goal is to like maintain that line of connection and support that person in being as safe as they can be. Um, and then asking open-ended questions. So being really curious, create opportunities to check in with them, um, like recognizing or naming some of the things you're seeing. I noticed that, da, 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 da. Do you want to share a little bit about, ba, 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 um, to really allow them to present from their perspective. <clears throat> Next one, please. And then the last two here are validating their experiences. This is a big one for teens. Um, 
all too, all too often teenagers feel like their experiences are not, um, not considered real. And that's a big part of teen dating violence is they, is young people being so self-conditioned to think that something isn't really that bad, um, because it's not taken as seriously by adults. And so really helping them validate that, you know, something that might not seem like a really big deal as an adult can be a really big deal when you're a teenager. Um, and the way that they're experiencing that matters. So not minimizing the effect that abuse is having on them, um, ensuring that they know that abuse is not their fault. Um, that's a really big one. No one deserves to experience harm. And then the last tip is just really involving them. So if someone does disclose, if they are sharing that they're in a harmful situation, sharing what local resources are available um, and giving them some choices, asking them how they want to move forward. Um, we are really big proponents in um, letting survivors lead or letting folks who are um, experiencing the harm have some control um, over their, their situation. Um, so as much as we can, offering that is really important. Um, and on the right-hand side here, this I wish uh, photo is from um, a workshop that we collectively, as the committee did uh, a couple months ago with a group of young people and a group of adults. Um, we held a dual sort of workshop and the young people were able to write down what they wish adults would ask them or what they wish adults knew about their relationships in an anonymous way. And this really allowed them to sort of can like do some self-reflection and think about like, what do I wish adults would say to me? Or like, what do I want to hear from them? And then share that anonymously to some of the adults in their life. Um, so thinking about ways to do this, if you are a leader of a group of youth, um, uh, we have lots of tools like that for, for our community. I will pass it along. Hi. So, um, we understand that like navigating, um, a situation of teen dating violence or domestic violence, it is very difficult to do, um, when trying to support, um, the survivor. So just remembering that you are not alone. Um, if you, in your team still don't have like a plan on how you could navigate a situation um, if it does come up working together to make that plan um, and using your resources. Um, I believe that most um, faith leaders are mandated reporters, correct me if I'm wrong, but just remembering to if you see something to say something um, and there, it, we do have a hotline that I will share on the chat that you're able to access. Um, we do have a national um, TDV hotline with love is respect. Um, is if you, um, if a youth does seem to be experiencing something, this is a hotline that you are able to refer them to. Um, they do chat through text and calls. So if they use them themselves or know someone that may benefit from um, getting in touch with um, a professional, they're able to um, go through this hotline. I'll be sharing that in chat as well. Um, and one really cool thing about what Love is Respect, they do have a website with different toolkits. Um, if you're looking to learn more about teen dating violence and how that um comes as a, like in teens. So there's different toolkits and resources that you're able to use. Uh, we also have a couple of community resources um, throughout the county of San Diego and different partners. Um, we that you're able to refer any um, individuals who are experiencing violence um, in their relationships or at home. Um, with, and then we also have other um, educational resources that you're able to access if you're looking to um, create a lesson or 
um, a presentation for the individuals you are working with. And I'll leave that in the chat. Um, but we do offer, um, as the Teen Dating Violence Committee, we do offer different presentations. So you're able to um, either email us or use the QR code. And based on your location, we could connect you with the um, preventionist that is closest to like the city that you are located in. And... Um, and that was it for um, for today. Um, and I'll be opening it up for any um, questions that you may all have. But I'll still be sharing our Teen Dating um, Violence Committee's Gmail that you're able to connect with us if you have any questions or need any resources. Thank you. Great presentation. Thank you for the statistics and, and some tools that were um, shared with us this morning. I do have a question on um, anger management. I didn't hear that um, mentioned. And I was wondering if um, throughout the course of developing this, if um, say the abuser, do we ever help them with anger management classes or tools or techniques? Because that's probably one of the underlying, um, even the, the victim would be angry about what they went through. So are you guys offering something along those lines? Um, I can share on behalf of Center for Community Solutions um, and well, a little bit also for San Diego County. I will say that um, funding and support for abusers is extremely limited. Um, there's almost, there are very few programs that support, um, folks who have committed, um, uh, harm, um, in this way. It's pretty rare that there's funding for it. Um, I know there's one organ and, and I'll also say that often the funding only comes after there's been significant harm done. So I know of a program that does support with, um, like abusers, they have like a whole program that they go through, but it's only after like court ordered. And so it has to be raised to a level of being in systems involved before folks are able to access like that programming, which is definitely a problem. Um, but unfortunately that's the some of the limitations on um, just like financial resources. Okay. Thank you. Something that I wanted to interject with that, Karen, is that if you see that there is a problem with anger um, and they're open to therapy, um, they're, they, they now have online therapy platforms, which this makes it a lot more comfortable for the person to be able to communicate their anger um, instead of having to go to a therapist, you know, in, in, a, in like a counseling office. Um, Better Health, Telehealth, all of these um, online platforms have therapists and counsel, have psychologists that are available online and on Zoom. So like if you can get the person to think, oh, you know, maybe we can do some coaching um, and using the correct words. Like, for example, I'm just giving this example because my son did not want to see a therapist. He says, no, I don't want to see a therapist. So I presented the idea as a coach. And he was open to the coaching role. Um, and so he's be getting help now through Zoom and through these connecting to these conversations when he was very close minded about going anywhere for counseling or going anywhere for those things. So that would be a route that I would say you can take and saying, you know, why don't we get some help? Um, it's private. You can do it on Zoom. And a lot of these places do. They do accept insurance. Um, they also there are some cash Um you know, where you have to pay cash, but maybe having a conversation of like, you know, why don't we address this this way? They're going to be able to help you address this anger that you have going on and, 
And, you know, we want to, we want to definitely channel it in a different way. It's not that anger is a bad thing. It's because we want them to express this anger, but we also want them to channel it in a different way, like maybe in a sport, but, you know, like maybe playing soccer. Um, so also not being like, oh, this is not, it's not good or bad, but let's just find ways to, to channel this in a, in a different way. And then, you know, through therapy, um, I, I believe it takes a, um, I, del- I believe it takes a village, right? Like, okay, so let's put this kid in soccer. Let's put this kid in maybe jujitsu where he can learn a discipline, you know, and then maybe get them um, online therapist. And so they're like, they're in the comfort of their space. And then they have a therapist that they're speaking to on their phone, which is so much more comfortable than going into a therapy office. Um, so those are the things that have helped me as a parent um, with my son who did not want to go into therapy and was very close-minded about it, um, just to let you know. May I interject oh, also, Karen? Um, so I'm sure you've all heard of Project Respect uh, run by the Sheriff's Office. And I, I have seen just firsthand the transformation that um, they just facilitate with these kids. And many of them are, I mean, they came from the juvenile system. Um, They came from these unhealthy relationships, um, but rooted because they are growing up in a household where they are watching domestic violence happen. Um, They are watching this. So it's not that they're growing up violent, just they picked it up. It's because this is what they're, you know, they're faced with, with their parents. And um, it just, Project Respect has that mentoring. And it comes down to mentoring. It's not a one and done. It comes down to who's going to be that consistent person with that team. And I, I you know, that's something, another thing to look into. Um, uh, they do, you know, their graduations, one in South and then the North one, they do it out of one safe place. And just to see um, the pride in these formerly justice involved children and they are children they're 14 15 year old you know and and to 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 hear them say somebody believes in me you know someone's taking the time and cares about me um and I have this mentor it's not graduation and then I'm never going to see this mentor again I, I can still call on him and they happen to you know work for the sheriff you know and they're just um, men and women that are so dedicated. They don't wear their sheriff uniform. They just wear their plain clothes, and but they're so dedicated to these kids. So that's another form of, you know, if they cannot afford therapy or they cannot find something, you know, individual that way, that um, Project Respect just does a great job with the mentoring, um, providing that mentor, especially for our young men. That's awesome. Thank you for that information, uh, Claudia. I wasn't, I think I've heard of them before, but now I'm going to take a look at it because the, you know, the embracing of the young people and, and validating them. And um, I love the two terms that came up, coach and mentor, because that takes away the stigmatism of, you know, I, I'm not crazy. I don't need to go to therapy, but actually they do need help and they're really kind of crying out for help. So, yeah, this is really good. Any more questions? Because I I have like six more, but (laughs) not about. Uh, The one thing I wanted to add to the coaching and mentoring part is letting them know that, you know, like Claudia said, this is a lifelong thing. It's okay to ask for help. And everybody has mentors, like putting it in the scope of Michael Jordan has a coach, you know, like everybody had coaches that were um, those people that were really great, like they had coaches and it's okay um, to have these coaches and develop that long-term relationship. Great, great information. Any more questions? Oh, is there any statistic on um, how many times um, the, the teens that you're serving grew up in a home with domestic abuse going on, domestic violence going on. Is there any kind of connection there? You know, I'll speak to that because my son um, did experience, um, he did experience abuse and um, it's, I wanna say that 
you're we're, from my personal experience okay and I don't know what the statistics out there are but from my personal experience we're seeing that there are there's more likely um it to happen with with homes that are unstable and that have experienced either there's a single mom there's not a dad in the picture um and or even like you know there is a there is a mom and dad but they they come from a blended family and so there's this like there's like this kind of like this little trauma that hasn't even been um addressed of like losing a parent or um, you know, that there's like, and so there's so many blended families that we have, right, or single parents. And so there's like that little underlying trauma that sits under, and then it that it's not addressed. And then it goes into the next phase and the next phase and the next phase. At least that's what my experience has been. Um, and, you know, what I've seen it more likely not to say that it doesn't happen in stable homes, but it's more likely to happen in blended families um, and then also single moms. Yeah. yeah, the statistics that we shared today were from the um, San Diego Youth Behavior Risk Survey that takes place every two years um, nationally. And so you can pull statistics directly from a school district or um, a county. Um, I know there are more statistics on the CDC website regarding intimate partner violence. I don't think there's any that specifically pull youth, like that pull whether like a youth was ex has experienced violence in the home. But um, ACEs scores do include like when when youth go, th you know, that, that it does include having seen violence in the home on ACEs score. So I'm sure I, we know that that is a factor. Um, I don't know if that there are sp specific statistics on it. I'm glad you brought up ACEs because that was going to be my next question. If we're, um, I think they have to be, is it 18 before we can do the ACE test on them? But that might be very beneficial for them. Yeah, I don't think so. We, um, Center for Community Solutions can do therapy with youth, um, like age six and up. And I think at age 12, we're able to conduct different ACE scoring, um, because between 12 and 14, youth are able to access therapy without, um, like requiring both parental consents, um, so that they can seek out support if there is an abuser that still has, um, you know, uh, legal rights over them as a as a young person. Um, well, thank you, ladies, for the services, all of you, that of what we're doing and how we're impacting, especially young lives. That turns out to be prevention. You know, intervention and then prevention is is what I'm hearing here, and um, that's amazing because they need it. They need. They're our future. And we need them to become scientists and engineers and doctors, right? We don't need them in juvenile hall and jail because, yeah, I just, I've seen too much in my own family. And it does, it is, it is sometimes not hereditary, but it transfers to the next generation. If there's not some interception like what you ladies are doing and we really appreciate that. Any more questions? Yeah, generational trauma impacts us all, absolutely. I think that's a lot of times why we do what we do. I know that's why I'm a domestic violence advocate because of what happened to my sister and, or, yeah. So on behalf of the faith community, I wanted to share one thing that um, is a major breakthrough for us. Claudia, I don't know if you know this or not, but one of our goals in the faith committee was to bring churches, mosques, and um, Catholic, it, just universal um, faith leaders to the table. And one of our goals we set was to partner with, with churches and temples. And um, so we have our first church, the Lutheran church in, in Encinitas. They were actually going to be going there. Mia and myself will be meeting with them next month for our first 
DV training. They're having their pastors and their deacons and senior leadership at the church will be joining us to discuss what domestic violence is, how to be aware of it, and what to do when it shows up because people hide behind the church. There's a lot of hiding. DV is one of the hidden things. We put it in a closet and in that closet are the men, women, and children. And we would think that church is a safe place to go. But if the church is not equipped or if the pastor or the uh, whoever, Quran, whatever they're studying, they'll use that against the family. Say, well, the word says you're supposed to go, to, you're supposed to stay married to that person. But you won't find abuse. I, I'm a Christian. I'm going to go ahead and say, but you won't find the word abuse in the Bible, but you'll find examples of it in there. And it's and he, creator, hates abuse. That's it, impacted from one human to another. So we're really excited to be able to meet with the Lutheran Church. Karen. Yes, so that was such a major you. breakthrough for us. So that's our offering because you know whenever faith people meet, there's always an offering table plate that goes around, and you put a few dollars in. But we are here to offer that. So if you're a church that you're attending, your mosque or um, wherever you're worshiping. If they're if they're not talking about it, we're happy to come and stand before the the constituency and talk about my story of domestic abuse and why I do what I do and how I hid behind the church or how the preacher told me no don't no we don't talk about that you go home and work it out you know kind of thing um, is what happens in the her church and I I remember uh, an abuser saying that he hid behind the church he never did they never knew and so. But our biggest concern, I one of them is our, is the safety one and our children who experience. Yes. And so we we are offering to help any um, faith uh, congregations across San Diego County. And so we're just really excited to be finally sitting down with some with some leaders and equipping them and and doing some training with them. So. Yay. Thank you, Karen and Mia. That's fantastic. I love it. One church at a time. You know? Yes. That's, that's just yes. On it, I think that is an amazing breakthrough, Karen. That is amazing. I mean, I think I've been praying for that. Like, I, you just answered my prayers. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I'm also, I'm also here in Encinitas, so please count me in to go. <laughs> okay. Awesome. We'll send you, I, I'm not going to send it to Paul Martinez, but we'll send you an invite. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any more questions or comments or thoughts? <laughs> 